I'm Ewan Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Philip B. Williams, I came to his work through a poetry collection called Mutiny. And if you haven't read it, please go back, pick it up. We're going to talk a little bit about mutiny in this conversation. But wait until you meet Philip B. Williams' novelist. Ours is his debut. It is spectacular. We are going to find a way to talk about this book without spoilers. We were chatting about it at, before we hit record. So if you hear both Philip and I sort of start to stumble a little bit, it's because we don't want to ruin this book for you. It is magic. Hafiza Geeter, the poet and the literary agent and the writer and the critical thinker, Hafiza Geeter actually told me that Philip's novel was coming probably right after it sold. So long before there was a manuscript that anyone could share, and I got it pretty quickly. I had a bound manuscript actually a while ago, and I had been waiting to do this interview because this book. And Philip, I'm going to ask you to set up a tiny bit of the story. So let's talk about place. Let's talk about the opening year. And let's start with Saint. Okay, Saint. Place, just north of St. Louis, Missouri. The town is originally called Graysville. This is the beginning. This isn't a spoiler. But then, you know, some, some things happen and then the town becomes ours. And this is 18... 30, early 1830s, 1834, 1835. And, you know, it's one of those places that has a way of being protected. You imagine, mm -hmm. you know, how do you have this, how do you have this location where the freed and escaped enslaved uh, Black people live and there's little to no interruption? You have to read the book. It's, there's something going on there. <laughs> there is something going on there. And you're pulling from a lot of different traditions. As you yes. tell the story. I mean, there are going to be readers who come to it and say, oh, well, there's a bit of magic here and there's a bit of folklore. And this feels like a little bit of a fairy tale. I mean, the language is what mm -hmm. drives us through the story. And yes. yes, you're a poet first, although you did say in an earlier interview to someone, we were like, well, I always thought I was going to write fiction first. And then I went <laughs> to poetry and now I'm back. And we're going to come back to that. But the language is what got Mm -hmm. And as you're setting this up, I'm like, okay, I'm going to follow Philip. I'm just, <laughs> we're going to see where this goes. And the language just kept me so grounded in the story. And Saint, who's, you know, the, the story really does kind of revolve around her. She's complicated. Mm -hmm. And I think there are going to be some readers <laughs> who have a little bit of a raised eyebrow. Yes. As they go through. And that's fine. I had a little bit of a raised eyebrow, but I really love her. She's imperfect. She's prickly. <laughs> <To say the least. laughs> she has very many ideas about how the world should run. And, and sometimes that's not quite how things go. I feel like you've been walking around with Saint's voice in the back of your head for, the, for a while. I feel like you mentioned in the, in the afterword to the book that this started as a short story, which having helped the novel in my hand. Right. <laughs> like, it's unbelievable. So can we talk about the short story? Can we talk about Saint? Can we talk about how we just got to this amazing, beautiful world that you created? Absolutely. 2006, I was an undergrad. I submitted this short story that I knew wasn't a short story to the contest that Crystal Wilkinson judged, who's, you know, a prolific writer herself. And she chose it for fourth place, which I honestly do not believe existed. I think it was made just for, for that story. And in her note, she said, this feels like the beginnings of a novel. And I felt mm -hmm. very sane. And in that story, Joy actually took the majority of, okay. you know, the energy. Sane was merely a side character. She was a bit of a gimmick. You know, mm -hmm. she wasn't fully fleshed out. Yep. And there, there was no... There were no other characters who appear in ours as is. There are some shared names and there are some shared archetypes. And just over the course of the 16 years that it took me to <laughs> write the book, with the last four years of 2018 to 2022 being this version of the book, okay, Stang decided that she wanted to take the forefront because there's a character named Francis who had stepped up to the plate to be the, the quote unquote main character, you know, you know how I feel about that term. Mm -hmm, um, I do. <laughs> but Saint, she wanted to be more complex. She had flaws where Francis did not in those iterations. So she was more interesting to write. So that's how she became the core. 
We'll come back to Joy. We're, what we're <laughs> going to do, though, is we're going to keep to a very pared down cast. Yes. There are a lot of folks who roll through hours and around hours, but we're not going to hit everyone. There's there are some themes that pop up. And again, we're really avoiding spoilers because this is the kind of book the story never stops moving. Right. And there's some digressions and you do some funky stuff with time. But <laughs> I I think I read it in two sittings. Honestly, I think I, I made it to the halfway point and then I was like, oh, I should slow down for a second because if I keep going at this pace, it's going to be over before I'm ready to let go of these folks and this place. Part of what you're wrestling with in the story, because it is you, and it is very much something that I think, even though we're talking about the 1800s, right, I think a oh. lot of us can relate to this idea of what freedom means and what freedom's mm -hmm. supposed to look like and what freedom's supposed to feel like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of us right now, and you and I are taping sort of in January, we're taping about a month before the book comes out, but I think the world right now feels very unsettled, more so than in past years, I think. And freedom is a word that your characters are poking at, yes. you're poking at. Yes. as the novelist, and I'm poking at as the reader. So we're coming from it from all these different angles. And you also mentioned that the story evolved the last four years is this iteration of the book. So I'm wondering, yes. was freedom always the thing that was going to drive this? Freedom behind the scenes. Yeah. Right. You know, behind the scenes it was. It became more of a forefront trope in this, this version of the book. So, yeah, this has always been there, but this, <laughs> this layered, no. We also have all of these sort of pairings of characters, and I'm not necessarily going to run through it, but the way freedom is sort of poked at and stitched at, and we're all sort of challenged to think about how we each define it. You're also working with pairs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, pairs of people, pairs of ideas, pairings show up. And I'm wondering how much of that comes from your work as a poet, or it was just what the novel needed? I think it's what the novel needed. Okay. In order for me to build the kind of intimacy that I wanted them to have, right. I wanted to keep the group small. So there's rare occasions where there are more than two people who are talking and getting to know how the other feels. And especially when thinking about freedom, it is in those pairings where different facets of freedom get played out, like the freedom to love, right? The freedom to be alone, the freedom mm -hmm. to do whatever comes to one's imagination, regardless of the aftermath. <laughs> and so those pairings allowed for the dualities of freedom, the different sides of freedom to start to butt heads in a way that I thought was really fun to write and helpful to keep track of it, <laughs> track of the various characters in the book. Because there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, but I think the fun that you had writing this book shows. And I think that's part of the narrative thrust of the story. The thing that keeps you turning pages, right, is because you're clearly having a good time. And, and I will say some of our characters don't always make great decisions. They don't. Sometimes they do. <laughs> but sometimes you're like, OK, we're going to see where this takes us. But structurally, 16 years, I mean... The book is not short, but 16 years and a couple of different iterations. And yet prior to that, you were known primarily as a poet. You've, you're a graduate of Cave Canem. You've taught poetry. You've taught all kinds of writing. But to live in multiple iterations mm -hmm. of this world with multiple iterations of these characters. Yeah. Can we talk about that experience for a second? Because you just, you sort of hinted at it. You were like, well, I had to keep track of everything. <laughs> but it's very easy. I mean, I never lost my sense of time or place or character. I mean, I always knew where I was sort of very firmly in the story. But I'm guessing that's not quite the same experience when you're creating everything. Mm, mm -hmm. I had no outline. Okay. I, I started off with an outline and... I think by chapter four or five, I saw that I was completely off of it. So I threw it out. It wasn't useful. Okay, this is what was important to me. I didn't okay. want there to be these false archetypes, these blank, stereotypical folks walking around. 
So the the magical Negro, the one who comes and saves everyone, and then they continue to to martyr themselves, continue to be everyone's savior. Meanwhile, they are suffering quietly. I didn't want that person in the book at all. I wanted there to be space for everyone to have their complexities. And it was over the course of those years, and it took that long for me to even know what Saint wanted. I had no idea what Saint wanted until I got to like maybe 2019, and I was maybe a quarter of the way into the book. And then the more I learned about what she wanted, the more devastated I became that I had to write this book. And I did not know what was going to happen. That's why I had so much fun writing it. It was a lot more fun to write the novel than it's ever been writing uh, poems or a book of poetry. I had no idea what the characters wanted to do, were going to do, or even how the book ended. I just kept writing to see for myself what the end game was going to be. Okay, wait a minute. So I think you said in the past, though, that discovery is a huge part of the process when you're working in a poetic form, like discovery is the sort of the guiding principle of what you're yes. doing. And yet you've just said, well, I really didn't know what I was doing with the novel. And I'm having a moment because I've read most of your poetry. Mm-hmm. Like you knew where you were going there. And yet you're still balancing this with the idea of discovery. So are you talking about discovery in the sense of the reader finding what they needed? Or are you finding your way through the poem, too, as you're constructing it? It's a combination of both. Okay. But with poetry, I have a formal education with fiction. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, have no, I don't know the names of any styles or any of the techniques I'm using. I use them intuitively or based off, well, intu- intuitively and based off of other books that I read and saw, oh, that was cool how they did that. I wonder if I can do something similar. So when I say I didn't know what I was doing, I meant as far as technically saying okay. this is the craft element. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now I understand because I was like, wait a minute. I'm I was just a little confused. <laughs> Can we talk about some of those influences too? I mean, I think people are gonna think obviously of Tanahasi Coates's novel and certainly the last Jasmine Ward novel as well. You could argue that you're pulling from global influences. I mean certainly yeah. American influences too, but I'm kind of curious who some of those writers are. That made you say, oh, I want to know how to do that. I, I just want to be able to do the thing. Let's not worry yeah, about what the, the thing is called. What the thing is called. Jose Saramago was one of the earlier influences, particularly his book Blindness. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then Marquez, of course, 100 Years of Solitude is a huge influence on the <laughs> on this book. And there's a novelist, a fiction writer named, there are two I'm going to name, Thomas Glaive. Mm-hmm. who's a short story writer, essayist, who has a style that's been compared to Morrison and Faulkner. The sentences that spiral in and out of time, they just they seem to ramble, but they're so poetic and they're so precise in their language and feeling. And then the second is Carol Livia Heron, whose book, Thereafter Johnny, which takes place in D.C. and has a, a, a lot of dark elements to it as far as themes, but it it reads similar to, I want to say, Maud Martha in the way where it's just a lyrical overflow of just beautiful language. And so there, there definitely is an international inspiration that's behind my work. And then also for writers who I think are overlooked in an unfair way. I think, too, part of what works for me when I'm reading ours is not only the language, the characters are so fully realized in their own way. I mean, as you were saying, you were like, I am not, there are no stereotypes in this book. And no, there are no stereotypes in this book. (laughs) But there's a weight to the storytelling. And, you know, we're in this moment in books in general, where we see a lot of retellings of sort of Greek and Roman myths, or, you know, now we're seeing a little more of East Asia. There has also you know, been some Eastern European. We're starting to sort of say, hey, listen, these stories have been around for a really long time. You're doing that in a way with African-American folklore. Yes. And grounding some of the story in that, not necessarily the specifics, right? This is not like, you know, Athena stepped out of Zeus's forehead kind of territory, but it feels like you're walking around with that too, as the creator of this world. Mm -hmm, And I don't mm -hmm. want to lose sight of that. So 
Virginia Hamilton obviously is a piece of that, but who yes. else and and where else are we pulling from? We are pulling from family stories as okay. well. <laughs> as okay. well. So it goes back to the oral tradition. Mm-hmm. Who who tells the story? How do they tell it? Is there a lesson? If there's a lesson, then it's a folk tale. Mm-hmm. If it's something heroic happening is and it's based in reality, it's probably a legend. If it's inexplicable, built into the largesse of life, it's likely myth. And so all of those those elements are in the story. There's even a, a retelling of a story that my mother told me that her father told her that he experienced in Gary, Indiana. And it's a creepy story. So there's some horror things <laughs> happening with that as well. But yes, it's part of the, the oral tradition, what stories were, were told to me growing up. Well, but also including all of the bits, right? Like, why should you tell a story that's only horror? Why should you tell a story that's only like, you kind of do need all of the pieces to round out this community, right? There, I mean, yeah. there are a couple of characters who roll through town and you're like, okay, hello, Reverend. <laughs> There's some neighbors where you're like, oh, okay. Okay. I, they, just, they haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> yeah. And what's going to happen is what's going to happen. And and certainly there are elements to the story that could be described as not your average everyday kind of stuff. Right. That's that's. But to have that sense of discovery and serendipity and wonder, it parallels your character's journey. Like I felt like I was learning as they were. Mm-hmm. And that I wasn't being left out or like I wasn't being left out of the story. I wasn't being left out of the joke in some cases. It was like, oh, you guys don't know. Not at all. What's happening either. <laughs> and But that's part of the immersive nature of this novel that you've created. But you're also playing with time in a funky way. And, and now we dance. Now, <laughs> Philip, we're going to have to dance so we don't give anything up. But you do, you play with time in a way that it becomes its own sort of character, its own piece of the landscape. Yes. And the town is its own character as well. Yeah, oh, it definitely (laughs) It definitely is. But let's talk about time and place for a second, because novels obviously are about that kind of interiority, that sense of place. Like, you know, when you're reading something and you don't have a firm grasp on where you are, it's kind of like, "Mm." Mm -hmm. and that can happen even when it's a linear timeline. Yes. It just depends on who's telling the story and how they're telling it, right? But you're juggling all of these different pieces, and it works. Thank you. You've got no outline, which, okay, I totally get that too. But how are you staying seated in the work as you're going through it? What's holding you close to the material? And I don't mean you holding the material close to you. I mean what's holding you Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. was anchoring me to the story. Yeah, exactly. ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's totally fair. <laughs> ADHD, the hyper-focus, there, you know, there were times where I was sit and didn't know how many hours had passed. Okay, okay. So you were just in story. it. I was okay. in it. It, 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 was, it was a spiritual experience. It was so much fun, but also very intense. And I also do not like when there are unresolved issues in a story it okay. freaks me out okay. so i i knew when i left something dangling what it was and that it had to be resolved okay. because i can't i can't handle when there are loose plot points <laughs> okay that's fair i'm one of those people who i will actually read around stuff if it's really if it's not something that brings me to a screeching halt, I, I can just ignore it and just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to finish books. I mean, there mm. are times where I know very quickly in if something is for me, not for me. And occasionally, sometimes you have to dip into the middle and dip into the end. But, you know, for the most part, I see these people online saying, well, I have to finish. I'm like, no, actually, you don't. You don't. And it is, it is just a, not a great way to engage with the written word if you just feel like you're forcing yourself to finish something i'm like if it's not for you it's not for you someone else will find it yeah, it becomes homework then so i've never studied poetry formally i was not an english major in college i'm just a big giant goofy reader who's been doing this for a really long time i mean not the podcasting piece the the reading piece and the book selling piece i've been doing for a really long time mm-hmm. and so 
being able to connect the dots, right? And being able to see sort of where you've pulled from the wider world mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and created ours. I am, I really love Saint. I really do. And I know I keep coming back to her, but she's one of these women who is just very honest about who she is. Mm. <laughs> She reminded me a little bit of, of actually Leonie in Sing Unburied Sing, right? Like she's just, she's on this path. She's not perfect. She's doing what she can to the best of her ability. It's just, you know, the consequences are slightly different. Mm-hmm. And I'm obviously comparing a novel that is not historical fiction with historical fiction, but there are some elements in Sing Unburied Sing that I don't think would be unrecognized mm-hmm. in, in ours. How well did you have to know Saint in order to create her world? Or did you just sort of let the work come and then kept going back to... I suspect you do a lot of rewriting just based on lines you've dropped here. (laughs) Okay, so the first iteration, she's just who she is in the short story. And then slowly... She just wants more space. Okay. She wanted more space. She, okay, so I don't, are you familiar with the story that Toni Morrison said about Pilot and Song of Solomon? I might be, but at the same time, I think it's a really good story to share with listeners. So can you drop it here? Because I think it's a really good piece of context, but I don't want to misrepresent. Yeah, yeah. So she was talking about writing Song of Solomon and how, you know, Pilot came into the story and Pilot would not stop talking. and She tried to take the story over. And Morrison said, I had to tell her, wait, now, this isn't your story. This is not your story. This, mm-hmm. it, you know, belongs to these characters over here. I did the opposite. Saint said, hey, I'm over here. And I said, OK, you can have it. Let's see. Let's see what you can do. It was the best decision I could have possibly made. And I don't know what it was. It, I was on the phone with Sophia Sinclair and we were talking and I was stuck. I was stuck. I don't remember what she said, but whatever it was, it must have been brilliant. Because I stopped and I was like, that's it. And she's like, what? <laughs> I was like, I have to change the gender. <laughs> oh, okay. I know. All right. I understand exactly what that reference is. And we're uh-huh. not going to go beyond that and spoil it. But when you were talking about Sophia, I was just like, oh, right. Cannibal. I was late to Cannibal. And it is one of the best collections of poetry I've read. In a while. I mean, and I get to read some pretty great poetry. Please don't misunderstand me. But she got me to read The Tempest again. (laughs) Huh. And I'm not someone who runs to Shakespeare. I mean, I've got colleagues who can quote, you know, sonnets and plays and all that. And I'm kind of like, yeah, "Yeah, that guy. I'm, I'm, (laughs) I'm familiar enough with the references to understand when they pop somewhere else. But her collection, Cannibal, I feel the way... I do about mutiny with her collection cannibal. I just think there's so much energy on the page and your titles. Your mm-hmm. I was just like, oh, hello. <laughs> Philip has a lot to say and he will be heard. And I love this. And, you know, obviously you and I had not met when I first read mutiny and I was just like, who is this guy? What is he doing? And I'm wondering when you're starting do you know when you sit down, whether the thing is going to become long form prose or if it's, if it needs to be a poem. I mean, you do have, there's a piece in, I think it's in Thief in the Interior, right? Witness, right? Is that right, the, right. Okay. And it's very, very long, but it is still in verse. Right. And it's very intense and it's very beautiful, but it's also about a murder and what happens afterwards. But I mean, when you're sitting down, what's the process look like for you? It can be an image. Mm-hmm. It can be a desire to work with a particular sound. Like when within, in Mutiny, there's a poem, Mushmouths May Be Crown. Oh, yeah. With all the words beginning with either the letter M or the sound, mm, the, the, the humming. It's, it's really the, when I say discovery, I mean I go to the page with such small detail and I am sitting there to see where it could possibly go. I have no idea where it's going to go. Sometimes I even work in reverse, which meaning like I'll have I'll have a title. And I've done this with 
something new I'm working on. Can't talk about it. But okay. I, have a, I have a title and then I use that as a writing prompt as opposed to writing the poem and then titling it at the end. So it's always with the, a smaller detail and then I'm just, let's, let's go. But working with sound and image, those mm-hmm. are the ways that a lot of my poems unfold. And hearing you say that, I'm thinking, well, wait, isn't that how you built ours, though? Because there's a cadence to your prose. There's a cadence to the imagery. There's a cadence to the dialogue. And that cadence doesn't always match, right? Like, it's it's what you need it to do when you need it to do, right? Like, the dialogue yes. is, is doing its thing. And I'm just like, wait a minute. So you built a 500-something page, well, 573 pages. You built this novel and this world and these characters out of layered images. Mm, I have to think about that. <laughs> no wonder it took 16 years. No wonder it took that four-year epic rewrite to get what we have. Yeah. So when you're sitting down, because I do also suspect you're one of these writers who's just like, well, actually, the writing is in the rewriting. And I'm wondering, too, what that looks like. I mean, are you going through... I mean, when you when you sat down in 2019 to work on the version that we now hold as ours... How much of a shift was there? I mean, did the nature of the narrative change or was it just sort of... Everything changed. Oh, everything. Okay. Everything changed. There are some characters who appeared in the short story who come later, but they're flipped. The plot idea, the story idea is is relatively the same. The plot is completely different. Okay. Um, The way that it's mapped out is is very different. I wrote the first chapter of ours after I was already halfway done with the book. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No. <Yeah. laughs> okay. I was wondering about that because, I mean, like I said, I was willing to follow you. I, without a doubt, I was just like, okay, let's see where this goes. But I knew the basic outline of the story, but I really very specifically did not want to know more. And I was reading a bound manager. So it literally had the title in your name on a piece of white paper and that black <laughs> binding that looks like duct tape. Yes. <laughs> and then I just, I was, I was really reading blind. Honestly, mm-hmm. I was really reading blind. And then I went back and uh, when I was prepping for the show and I was working off of the very pretty. It's gorgeous. It. Okay. Can we talk about this jacket for a second? Because I yelled. I frequently <laughs> yell. Um, when I'm excited about something, but it this jacket, okay, this jacket, unbelievable, is amazing. And do you is there anything about the painter that you know or the painting itself because it's it's so perfect? So Lynn Buckley designed it, and okay. she sent they sent seven designs. She's amazing. All of them were good. This one in particular with that artwork by Dami Lola Opadun, who's a painter in Lagos. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'd never heard of him before. I'd never seen his work. And now I'm a huge fan. I want to buy that piece that is the cover, but I can't. It's already been purchased. And you, we will understand what I'm about to say without the without the spoiler. Those yellow halos, the saint, like that tells it all right there. That says so much about, you know, what the book aims to accomplish and the way that they are arm crossed and how just beautiful and and head up you know the heads are up and the hoop earrings are also an interesting touch you know yeah <laughs> so it's all good it, it's all good it spoke to the novel in ways that it felt it was made for the novel it absolutely is you know people doing the best they can right with what they have what they have sort of isn't that all of us like it doesn't really matter that we're talking about people in the sort of early 19th century, it's just there are certain things about being human that kind of don't change. And and I want to mm. jump back actually to something you said to Kaveh Akbar on Dive Dapper when he yeah. interviewed you for the website there. You know, he's another poet who has a novel coming out. His novel is coming out shortly before yours. And Martyr is pretty great. Different sensibility, but still pretty Oh, great. completely different book. Uh, I, I read that in four days. I don't right? read novels, but I read that right? one very quickly. It's, oh, it's good. But, you know, and it, it's in the context of Witness, the poem that I mentioned from Thief in the Interior, which was your debut collection. But you say, I did that for a reason because history is not really proceeding as much as it's going back in time. And I feel like that line, and this is an interview you did a while ago. A long time ago. But it really feels like, oh, 
were these guys talking yesterday? I mean, this is from 2016. <laughs> and I do feel like that's a lot of what's pulsing through ours. Mm-hmm. We can be as well-intentioned as we want to be, and sometimes we're still going to get it wrong. So how much of this is you letting the story happen, but yet you may not know what the craft thing is called, but you know what mm-hmm. has to happen. Like, how do you pull off that balancing act and still get a thing that you want to read that other people are going to want to read that isn't just an exercise in getting a story out? The exercise in ego, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which most writers, I think all writing might be. <laughs> I don't want to be philosophical. I don't have the, the patience with myself to do that. But <laughs> there, there is a way where I might be being dishonest here. I'll regret this answer later. I want to create a door. Okay. And I want to okay. show the reader that it can be crossed, but they have to do that work on their own. I, I don't want to. Fa- no, I think that's fair. I don't think you okay. should. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a totally fair thing because. Reading isn't a passive act, right? You know this. You've been reading your entire life. It's not a passive act. You bring whatever your background or experience, whatever, however you want to define it, you bring yourself to whatever you're reading. So you and I can read the same thing. We may have similar thoughts, but you and I are not going to come up with the same exact interpretation of a thing. We're just not. And that's what I love about literature. I really believe there's a book for everyone in the world. I really do. I do think more people should play around with poetry (laughs) and reading it. Um, And I've said this before on the show, but like Thanatopsis was shoved up my nose when I was in junior high. And I was like, please, not this. I I can't. (laughs) But then I hear sort of a modern poet riffing on how they pull from maybe the sonnets or Keats or whatever. And I'm like, I have to sort of rethink this, don't I? I mean, (laughs) Byron is not my idea of a fun date. So for you, you're pulling from all of these different places, right? And you're still going to sound like Philip. That's the hope. The hope is that I have a voice that is recognizable. I've been asked through the, what do they call the questionnaires that I have to do for the press. They're like, what's, you know, what's really important to you? It's important to me that I write a book where someone opens it and they'll say, oh, yeah, this sounds like him, which is not to say that every book will sound the same, but they will know what my proclivities are, that I am first and foremost going to sing a song. I like a plain sentence. I like a straightforward narrative. I do not want to sound that way myself. I am not Ernest freaking Hemingway. (laughs) I'm just not. And I also think that the way that I write, and Mia, you read a lot more than I do, I'll tell you that now. I think the way that I write can be considered um, retrograde, not in the, in the sense that it's diminutive, like it's not saying that um, it's a bad thing, but I think it's an older style of writing to have so much, like, you know, singing and music, quote unquote, musicality in it to the point where it seems out of vogue. And I, I don't care. I want to do it. I want to bring people into the complexities of English that I think we've taken for granted in some ways. And I'm saying that because I've heard some some um, mm-hmm. students say that. They're like, oh, but I have to be simple. I'm like, for whom? For whom do you have to be simple? And what does simple mean? How do we define parameters? Who's telling you to write in a way that is actually in opposition to your imagination? So I just wanted to write the book that had all of the ambition that I've always wanted to read. And that I hear a lot of younger writers wanting to do, but they've been pushed out of that. They've been tempted as not pressured. They've been pressured out of that. Ray Carver, right? Like Mm -hmm. everyone thinks of Ray Carver, super stripped down. It's like, well, actually his editor may have done more editing than Ray was prepared for. I think you just have to sort of let the work also tell you what it's going to be. Yes. I mean, I never once, and I spent a lot of time with a lot of your work for a bit now, but... I never once felt like you were telling me an old fashioned story. I thought you were sort of conjuring this world around me where I was like, what happens next? Who are these mm-hmm. people? How do we get from point A to point? And there's some wild stuff that happens in ours. There's <laughs> wild stuff that happens in the best possible way, though, because it's true to the story. I mean, yep. but it also feels very true to what you're saying 
And you mentioned this, I think it's in the afterward, actually, where you're saying, well, I'm using mutiny and ours to create, and I'm just going to quote you for a second, a contemporary mythology for blackness in the United States of America. Yes. And I love the idea. I love the idea that it's poetry and prose that you need both to be able to do this. There is a slightly different sensibility in the language between the two. And yet that makes perfect sense to me. That makes <laughs> absolute sense to me. And I'm wondering if you would take a minute and, and riff on that a little bit, because it seems not to be missed in this conversation. It's, a, it's about timing. So when the Middle Passage happened, we were already, you know, leaning into, particularly if we move into the 1700s and the 1800s, it's the Industrial Revolution. There's the, the, the Enlightenment. Myth and folklore was already being looked down on. We have all these religious movements, particularly for Christianity. We have the persecution of using drums by those who are enslaved. And there wasn't an opportunity, in my opinion, this is an opinion, this isn't, this isn't there wasn't an opportunity for us to have a mythology that really explained an origin story outside of the trauma experienced through enslavement. And what one could do and what I think one should do is draw the, to map out what is traditionally from the African diaspora, what we share across continents, what we share across, you know, different cultures that speak to why there are so many similarities in our folk tales, right? It's because they're directly, you know, pulled from Africa. In this sense, I'm thinking of West Africans' uh, stories of the hare, and then we have Bro Rabbit in, in the U.S. But for something that is uniquely ours, that uniquely points to, and I mean contemporarily, so not mm -hmm. even thinking that far back. So how does one explain a chalk outline in a way that, brings a different light to it as though we don't know what this phenomena is. And in doing that, why do that? Not just for the sake of it, but what are we possibly missing when we don't have the inexplicable, when we don't have the ghostly, the haunting, the supernatural, the paranormal, the idea that there may be gods, goddesses, whomever, the unnameable watching us. I am trying to bring a practice that seemingly no longer exists, at least in my 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 mm -hmm. short sightedness as being an American, and saying what happens if we just try to myth again? We we know the facts, we know the science, and a lot of the science is bull, a lot of science is BS and race racist. Why not try myth? Why mm -hmm. not try to see this in the lens of things that are bigger than logic? Or have their own set of rules that are, you know, their own type of logic. Well, we also like to tell ourselves that we're logical creatures when, mm -hmm. in fact, I look at something like the stock market and I'm like, mm, that's all emotion. <laughs> that's all emotion. That is all fear. That is all emotion. That has nothing to do with logic. You can tell yourselves whatever fairy tales you want. And I think that sense of wonder and that sense of discovery, like it doesn't. I would hope that we don't lose that. I think that is like imagination is probably the thing that in the end is going to keep us grounded. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm dancing around it a tiny bit just to not accidentally <laughs> give anything away. But I mean, if you look at like the work Virginia Hamilton has done over time, or if you look at the work that you've done in your poetry or you know, Samarago's blindness or, you know, Garcia Marquez's novels, any of this, it's like, well, those are all acts of imagination and yet we can read them and suddenly this, yes. where we're sitting, makes sense. Yes. We may not always like what we're reading. We may not really <laughs> necessarily <laughs> like the things that make sense, but I love that. I love that give and take and that sort of push and pull because you kind of do need the stuff you can't explain. You need the stuff you can't explain, yes. And sometimes that's where the answer has always been. And what is required of that is quiet. There's so much noise in the yeah. world. And I and I I did not realize within the story mm -hmm. of of ours 
how many moments of absolute silence there are. People just sitting mm-hmm. and thinking or remembering or hearing the soft bug sounds, the insects chittering. Or It is such a quiet novel at points, the way the seasons, you know, come and go, winter mm-hmm. is quiet. We need those moments where the mind can not unravel, unspool, but just kind of softly settle and, you know, contemplate what have I experienced? What has this body experienced? And I think that myth allows for relaxation from <laughs> this, the terrors mm-hmm. of reality. <laughs> I think that's fair. I think that's totally, totally fair. Okay, wait, 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 wait. I have not forgotten about Joy because I love this character. She is, you write prickly women really well. I would just like to be on the record as saying (laughs) the prickly women. I love the prickly women. But Joy goes from being the heart of the short story that originally kicked off ours Mm -hmm. to an important piece of the book, but not the heart, not the center, the way you know, Saint really has become. So I want to talk about Joy's evolution for a second, because she is kind of a great character. We meet her in New Orleans. She has lots of feelings about lots of things. <laughs> but she also has kind of an interesting trajectory yes. in the narrative of ours that, I don't know if we want to say it parallels Saint, but can we talk about Joy? We can talk about Joy. Joy has had a childhood. Mm -hmm. Yes, she has. (laughs) She has had a childhood, and uh, it is one of complex love. Yeah. Very, very complex love. And, you know, sometimes that love is not always expressed in ways that engender a positive sense of self as we we hold her. And so her trajectory is similar to really all the others. It's just it, be, it begins differently. Okay. Her idea of, of freedom is, is bound with a traditional sense of love only because she's seen so much in her childhood. Right. You know, it's, she's, she's not one of those damsels in distress, as you will read and you will mm-hmm. see for sure. Mm-hmm. However, there are pieces missing because as she's, grown up, she has not witnessed a particular kind of love. And I just love her because she's trying so hard the entire time from the point she enters the book till whenever, we know, whatever happens with her. She is trying her hardest. And I really believe in Joy. I do. I love her. I, I mean, I love all of these characters. Straight up, I love all of these characters. And there are a couple of characters where I was like, oh, you're a pain, but I still love them. Because it's clear that you love, I mean, the reverend every now and again would get under my skin. (laughs) Just like, dude, you need to sit for a second, please. He was really kind of the only one that really sent me around the bend. But he just doesn't know when to sit and be quiet. And he still has his place in the story, all props. But I mean, you clearly have a lot of affection for these characters and you're letting them be who they need to be and all of that. And it's just, if the language is there, I will follow a writer. Like straight up. I just, but I really hold to the language and it, it's great that lots of stuff happens and we get lots of character arcs and whatnot, but I, I have to start with language. Mm-hmm. I really do. And if the language isn't there, I'm kind of like, hmm, okay, Same. I Same. can do it. I can do it if I have to, but I would enjoy <laughs> this a lot more if the language were, you know, slightly different. But you talk about joy and love, and it also makes me think that love and freedom are two words that we bandy about as a culture and a society. And we just, we play with those words in so many different ways. And I don't know what those words mean in a collective sense anymore. Right. Right. They're both founded in, I think, an ideal that we're afraid of. The two, vulnerability for one, Mm -hmm. which leads to sacrifice. You have to give something up. Right. To have to have freedom, you have to you have to give something up. Mm -hmm. To have love, to experience love as an action, there has to be something that you're willing to sacrifice. Right. And usually it leads towards for love, vulnerability. And for freedom, ironically, it's maybe another type of freedom. You know, in order to feel free, what are some of the comforts that you have to give up 
in order to get to the point where you can create your own mm-hmm. kind of comfort. That's re- that's really a challenge for, I'll speak for myself, um, to be open to risk in that way. I will tell you that I know I'm going to be thinking about all of this for a lot longer because of hours. I mean, I had the space to really sit with some big ideas that, you know, I probably should think about more. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But because of the way you bring together the story and these characters and the language, oh, please, the language. Yeah, I'm going to be thinking about this book for a really, really long time. And I know you hinted that there's a new thing coming that you can't talk about. But I'm going to ask you a general question about what might be coming. <laughs> so are we going to see both poetry and prose from you? Coming like I, it just seems to me now that you've you've done ours and it's about to be out in the world that maybe you know occasionally you might flip between poetry collections and novels and we might just see this is a year for poetry from Philip and this is a year <laughs> for fiction from Philip is that sort of what we're looking at? I don't know if it will be that clean cut. Okay, fair. But I don't plan on. I have many other novel ideas okay. that I want to explore. When it comes to poetry, I have gotten a lot of slower, mm-hmm. but I will say, and this, I can talk about this, that is what I've completed is another manuscript of poetry. Excellent. I'm delighted to hear that. Mutiny is great. It is great, but it's always nice to have. I, part of it for me, too, is I read so much fiction, and I and I do, I read a lot of narrative nonfiction, but not like, you know, serious histories kind of things with lots of, you know, footnotes it's much more about sort of story and and language but it's really nice to have poetry as a palate cleanser every now and again where you just have to focus on the language and how that brings you into story in a different way Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. every now and again i just i need to sit and also delightfully poetry books are tiny and you can feel like you actually accomplished something (laughs) Oh, the book is fast. I mean, it takes a while, but that story does not stop. No, it does not. It does not. And I'm smiling like a maniac because it really is. <laughs> it's all of the things you want. It's unforgettable <laughs> characters. It's great prose. Stuff happens. Thanks. And it left me with a lot to think about. And I do. I, you know, I love to be entertained by fiction, but I really do also want to be left thinking about things that Maybe I was a little reluctant to think about until a writer said, hey, Mm. by the way, (laughs) how about? And I'm really glad that writer was you, and I'm really glad that novel was ours. Philip, thank you so much for joining us on Port Over. Ours is out now. Mutiny is out. There's also Thief in the Interior. If you haven't, there's lots of of Philip B. Williams out there in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so appreciative of this moment and to speak with you. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.